Okay, so uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for uh, Relational Presence, Designing Virtual Reality in the Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation Project, a presentation by Jennifer Robert Smith and Christina Llewellyn, based on their work with the DOOR Project research team. For your information, we're recording this session and if all goes well, we'll be posting it with um, the permission of the speakers on the website for the Humanities Interdisciplinary Collaboration Lab, Think Lab at the University of Guelph. This is part of our Digi Cafe series of uh, talks on digital humanities. And I'm Susan Brown from English and Theater Studies at Guelph and I co-direct the Think Lab with uh, Dr. Kim Martin from History. I'm joining today from Guelph, uh, which is the site of the university that's sponsoring this talk. The university of Guelph and my house occupy the ancestral and treaty lands of several indigenous peoples, including the Atawandaran people and the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I recognize and I honor our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors. The Dish with One Spoon Covenant speaks to our collective responsibility to steward and sustain the land and environment in which we live and work so that all peoples, present and future, may benefit from the sustenance it provides. I also want to acknowledge the history of violence and dispossession that underlie the ongoing activism and protest of Indigenous groups and allies across Canada and the need to take action towards truth and reconciliation. Reconciliation is the subject of our presentation today by two members of the Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation Project. I am pasting into the chat longer bios of our two speakers. So I'm just gonna speak briefly to those um, right now. Jennifer Robert Smith, is Associate Professor of Theater, Perform and Theater and Performance at Waterloo, whose transdisciplinary work manifests in diverse contexts. She runs the Q Collaborative Intersectional Feminist Design Research Lab at Waterloo. Christina Llewellyn is Associate Professor of Social Development Studies at Renison College, also at the University of Waterloo. And she's worked extensively on oral history in relation to a number of sites of social justice. She's the PI of the Digital Oral Histories for Reconciliation Project. So before I ask them to begin presenting, a word on the format for today. They're gonna to present for maybe 20 minutes after which I'll get the conversation rolling with a question or two, but we'd really like to hear from you about this project and invite you to ask questions of the speakers. So feel free to put comments or short questions in the chat at any time and indicate if you would like to um, pose a question after the talk and also feel free after the, when we move into the Q&A session just to raise your hand, but feel free to flag also in the chat because sometimes we don't see raised hands um, all that easily in a Zoom environment. So um, with that, I'd ask you please to keep your mics turned off if you're not um, actually speaking. And so until later in the session, I will um, turn the uh, camera, so to speak, over to Christina and Jennifer to tell us about relational presence. Thanks so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, thank you to, to Susan and to Kim um, and the invitation coming from the, the Think Lab uh, to speak about our, our project. And I appreciate the uh, land acknowledgement as well. And we are both working from the University of Waterloo, although we are coming from different places right now, which is the traditional territory of the Atawadaran, Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee people. Um, UW is situated on the Haldeman Track, uh, which is uh, the land promised to the Six Nations and 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. And we want to acknowledge in doing the oral history work uh, that we do that um, as white settlers, we do recognize the sacred and powerful force of orality that's been preserved by Indigenous peoples and other equity seeking groups. So uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, not a lot of people uh, actually know about um, the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. And here, I'm just going to try to forward my slide if I can, which it doesn't seem to want to let me. Oh, here we go. That's great. Um, so again, not many people know about the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. So here, I'm just trying to allow you to get a, a brief sense of where it is uh, located. On June 6, 1921, a crowd of 3,000 spectators gathered for the opening of what I will refer to usually throughout the talk as the home. 
the newspapers describe this quote as the greatest event in the history of colored people in Nova Scotia. But the story of the home is one of a larger history of the institutionalization of childhood. And we know from uh, many historians, uh, in particular Veronica Strongbog's work, that this is a story of general tragedy. In this case, a white government purchased land and handed over the authority for care to mostly black workers. But the home was chronically under-resourced and the state turned its back on a cycle of violence and poverty, which was created by a long history of systemic racism in Nova Scotia, manifested itself within the home. There are records of approximately 700 children over the almost 70 years that the home was open that show that it was a place of abuse and neglect. For decades, the former residents of the home were raising their voices, their collective voices around what was happening in the home. They created in 2012, the organization VOICES as the acronym. It stands for Victims of Institutional Child Exploitation Society. The mission of VOICES has been to bring their stories of abuse, as they call it, out of the shadows and into the light. And they refer to this as their journey to light. And they ask others to join them in the journey to light. And we've been very privileged as scholars to uh, be invited to join them on the journey to light. And uh, Voices has the, um, the permission, the will of a larger community of former residents as well to take on this leadership work. Their activism resulted in the Nova Scotia government agreeing in 2015 to a restorative inquiry. The restorative inquiry looked back not to ascribe blame, but to shed light on the history and experience of the home in order to learn from it and move forward into a brighter future. Now, many of you think of inquiries in a more traditional sense, where there is a desire to find blame and then to provide recommendations. And, and I know as a historian, often those recommendations have not been taken up. And instead, this was iterative work that happened with the inquiry, where they brought people into the conversation who are all in charge of various systems so that they would do the work as the inquiry was ongoing. And again, the point was so that there would be system change and then all of these systems would be making commitments from justice to child welfare to education and so on. DOOR was created in 2016 to support the educational mission of the inquiry. And that was to learn together about the history of the home and racism, to understand not only what happened but why it happened and why it should matter to all of us. And to educate others about the former residents' experiences that would support reconciliation or right relations as it's often referred to in restorative justice terms. We knew that the former residents could not have in-person encounters with young people across the country nor could all young people visit the site of the home, although the actual site of the home does exist, although it's gone through various uh, iterations and reconstructions. How then, we asked ourselves, could young people learn from the former residents about their lived experiences that are extremely deeply rooted in a sense of place about the home? How could young people join the former residents in their invitation to the journey to light? Our answer collectively was the DOOR project. DOOR is, has developed a curriculum, a history curriculum, that provides opportunities for grade 11 Canadian history students to engage in historical inquiry about the home. They do so using various primary and secondary sources, including the oral histories of former residents through a virtual reality experience. The three former residents who you see there uh, in the picture, Tony Smith, Tracy Dorrington Skinner and Jerry Morrison are not only the narrators of the VR, they are the co-designers of the curriculum and of our full research process. The curriculum was piloted in two classes in late 2019 and is currently being revised for open distribution. And so I should note that it is a, a two week curriculum. So it involves a lot uh, of other supporting work to engage in these kind of historical questions about the home and really in helping young people think of ways in which they can engage, engage in restorative justice, including developing a restorative action towards the end of the curriculum. 
Of course, COVID interrupted our plans for broader distribution. Um, so we've been slightly delayed in some of that work. DOOR is then both a research creation project as well as empirical research. We actually studied the implementation of, of the pilot project. And when I say community driven here, I'm drawing upon the Ontario Federation of Indigenous Friendship Centers definition to say that it's not community based nor community placed. Instead, it is about communities having control. And you'll see here that there's four principles that are articulated in that framework, utility, self-voicing, access, and interrelationality. Now, the principles that guided our work was a restorative approach, but they very much align with this uh, community-driven research framework that, uh, that is noted here. And the restorative approach was uh, adopted by the former residents themselves through the work of voices as well as the inquiry. And DOOR has also adopted not only a restorative approach to how we conduct the work ourselves, but also as an, a learning outcome for the curriculum itself. And so a restorative approach to research is for the redress of harms in a way that enables human flourishing. And the four principles that we have worked with, and this is just some of them, uh, but four I'll mention here is one, prioritizing relationality. In this case, we were drawing upon the Afrocentric principle of Ujima of collective responsibility. The second being subsidiarity. And what that means, uh, not only as community control, but whatever decision needs to be made, we have to look at who is most affected by those decisions. And those are the people that need to be at the table making uh, the, final, uh, the final decision. As well as dialogue. Here we participated at all times in restorative circles in the way that we did our work. We embed that into the curriculum it, itself. And the importance of, of dialogue is not just so that people can be heard, but that it makes a difference to the outcome. And also the curriculum itself draws upon what has been um, uh, worked on by two scholars, one of which is on the project, Bronwyn Lowe, but also Emmanuel Sontag, on the pedagogy of listening in schooling, in schools. And lastly, I'll just touch upon future focused. Here, we're, we're seeking to develop students' historical consciousness. This is a term that's mostly developed within the history education world about how young people make sense of the past in order to take action in the present and in the future. And again, according to restorative justice, seeking ways in which this will be useful in moving forward in a good way. And this is all very much rooted in the Afrocentric um, concept of Sankofa. Again, this is drawn uh, from the former residents as well as the inquiry. And it is a, a Guyanese word and symbol, you'll see there the bird of a bird reaching back uh, to get an egg in its mouth while flying forward. And uh, it actually refers to going back into the past to get the lessons that are needed in order to move forward. So a restorative approach uh, that we took really necessitated a highly unusual uh, context for virtual learning environment design, a focus on the ability to engage just a quality of relationship with others in the real world, but through VR. Or more simply put, what we're referring to today and talking about, uh, relational presence in VR. And allow me then to give you just a brief overview of what happens in the VR experience, uh, which again is one central component, a very important component of a larger uh, curriculum. So students, and I'll show you a clip here in just a second, which is why you're seeing a, a, a black screen. Students meet the former residents about how they came to the home in a 360 video. And then they become transported into a VR build at the home. They hear stories, one from each resident. So they select one from Tony, they come back, they select one from Jerry, they come back, they select one from Tracy. And overall, there's 12 to select from. So typically, most students don't hear the same three stories. At the end, however, they do go to a common story. Students are then teleported to the outside of a rock, where again, it's a 360 video. And here, the rock is very symbolic. Um, because the rock is a place where all of the former residents have spoken about it being a safe space for them when they were in the home and the rock is still there on the property. So that's where we did uh, the filming. Here, the former residents speak about uh, their resistance, their activism since leaving the home. 
Overall, it's about a 15 minute experience. Uh, students do experience it individually, individual stations. When we did the pilot, there were about three to four stations at a time. So they do it in that sense in a, in a group way. They come in as a group, but then go to individual stations. Uh, there is onboarding that's quite careful to give warnings. There is a story about sexual abuse that we allow obviously for students to skip over. Um, and we have an easy way for them to indicate they want to do that. And during the pilots, we ensured that there were all, all, always support workers. In this case, Nova Scotia schools have African Nova Scotian support workers. There's also a debrief at the end where they come together and we do a check-in and we also, they're able to initially say what they heard, what stories they listened to. So we want to uh, show you one clip of the VR since we don't have a lot of time, we'd love to even show you more. This is a story that Jerry has, has said we could uh, share in this forum, and it's a story called Swamp Water. Now, there is um, abuse uh, discussed within the story. So if this is something that you would find uh, especially traumatic, then we would say you might want to turn off your sound. And then what we can do is once we move on to the next slide, you'll know that we are, we are done then with that, with that story. So I'll give you a moment. Bedtime at the home normally was done once a week. They would line five kids up and put five kids into the tub at the time. And we used to call it a communal tub because the tub was so big. I can remember standing at the doorway naked with the other kids. If you were there first, you got the clear water, the water was nice and clean, you could play into it and you had fun in it. But as the day progressed on and more and more kids got a bath, that water became darker and darker and literally turned black. We used to call it the swamp water. There were times I actually saw kids poop into the water. But no matter how dirty that water got, the maker still made you bathe in it. I can remember to this day kids sucking on face cloths while they're taking a the bath out of that water. Getting out of the tub, they always had just one towel for everybody. And that towel became extremely wet, and the maker would use that towel as a means of punishment by snapping that towel against your wet skin. She'd also grab you by the ear. In some cases, she'd grab you by your body parts and make lewd comments about you. To me, bath time was a time of humiliation. It was a time I'd rather forget. I will try to move on here for you, Jarrett. So I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Okay, thanks. Um, so maybe I'll just say a couple words about what you just saw um, in from a from a slightly more technical perspective. What that was was a screen capture um, of uh, of the participant experience. So somebody actually had a headset on um, and was inside the 360 degree like spherical image of the virtual reality experience. Um, and then what's, what's um, visible um, from the direction that they happen to be looking with their headset at that time is what we can see um, on a computer monitor. And we just did a screen capture of that um, experience on a computer monitor. Um, the image that the, the, um, the animation that you saw um, was a combination of 360 degree video um, shot in a um, scale miniature, a maquette size of the bathroom that was um, built, reconstructed, all of that, all of those finishes on the interior um, of the bathroom are like physical paint. Um, and, uh, and then that, that um, video of the um, interior of the model was superimposed inside a 3D graphical model of the architecture of the home um, that is uh, rendered in um, varying degrees of um, fidelity. So there are versions of that model that's just kind of the line drawings um, that were um, that we um, 
uh, that we borrowed from the architectural drawings of the original, um, from the original construction in the 1920s of the building. Um, and then also um, more fully rendered um, textures that give you a sense of opaque walls and um, environments. And then the, the final element that you saw there was um, an, in the window of the bathroom was a little 2D video um, that was taken of the road um, outside the house in the present. So when we were on location in uh, 2018, um, shooting on location, um, our videographer took a little video of the view um, of the road in the distance. So combining um, 360 video, two-dimensional video, and um, 3D graphics in that uh, rendering is what you saw. Um, so the challenge for us, um, having heard all of uh, uh, Christina's um, introduction um, to the reasons why um, the former residents wanted to use um, virtual reality for to communicate their um, oral histories to grade 11 students um, was that um, we were asking virtual reality to do something that it is not normally asked to do. Um, and specifically that is to that was to to create a relational awareness of the experiences of the former residents. So there's a couple reasons why that why that has not been typically what um, VR has been asked to do, largely having to do with the advantages that um, th a 360 degree surround image has for, for actually immersing you in uh, an experience and making you feel like you're in a place that you are not already in. Typically, um, typically the, that, that sense of being somewhere um, is um, referred to as presence and that is, tends to be the design goal of most, um, most virtual reality environments as uh, up until this point in the history of the medium. Presence um, has a, as a concept, has a life outside of VR design. Um, in, in psychology, um, it's defined as the psychological state where virtual experiences feel authentic and an individual's perception fails to acknowledge the role of technology in generating that experience. So it's very much um, associated with um, uh, the importance of forgetting that um, what you are experiencing um, is mediated. I'm going to try to move the slides myself. Can I do it? I can't. Christina, would you scooch that along um, for me? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so um, in educational, uh, con in, in the field of education, virtual learning environments are, are they, they're leveraging the, um, uh, the affordances of virtual reality technologies to generate the sense of presence, principally for experiential learning. So for learning tasks where we want students to do something, they want to learn, we want them to learn how to do something in the real world, but um, we can't teach them in the real world for some reason, typically because it might be too dangerous to learn in the real world. So when we're training surgeons, we want them to start working in simulations rather than on real people. Um, maybe it's too expensive. Um, so may, if we're trying to teach astronauts to fly, we can't put everybody in a spaceship. Um, maybe it's just impossible. So there are some simulations that are um, used, for example, of teaching students um, about uh, uh, gravity and the differences in gravitational fields on the moon versus on Earth, and we just can't get students to the moon. Um, so those are it, the, in those kinds of contexts. The what's what's most important in the design of the VL, in, of the virtual learning environment is that the simulated experience be as close as possible to um, a real life experience. And what you're seeing on your screen here are two other, these are not the only two, but the, these are two um, significant um, uh, approaches to um, uh, designing virtual learning environments so that they will generate that sense of um, simulation. So they will be as close as possible a, a, a simulation of real life and will generate um, the, the strongest sense of presence in learners. Um, in, uh, in among the design elements that are, are typically um, thought to be most effective, two that I want to mention are vividness and interactivity. So vividness um, refers to this, the degree to which the senses are engaged in a virtual illusion. So in most um, virtual environments in uh, virtual reality, headset experiences, 
we're um, really interested in engaging sight. Um, so we're trying to create a visual image that is as um, realistic as possible. Sometimes hearing, it's more difficult. Technology is not um, uh, as well advanced for, for touch. So haptic interfaces are less well developed typically than visual uh, interfaces. Um, the um, interactivity typically refers to um, the degree to which a VR participant's body is engaged in affecting the virtual illusion that has been generated um, in ways that they would ordinarily use their body in real life. So um, it, if I can, for example, um, uh, uh, if, if I can uh, move through space by moving my body through um, physical space, then that's understood to be um, a more sophisticated form of interactivity than if I have to click a controller to teleport myself forward um, through, through space. Um, when, um, when vividness and interactivity are highly developed in a virtual learning environment, the, what the research that's coming out of um, uh, education is showing um, is that that helps students focus on whatever the learning task is um, within the virtual learning in environment. And that helps them both learn better and also feel more satisfied. Um, they have this kind of sense of accomplishment. Um, and there's an, uh, it's easier for students to transfer what they've learned within the um, virtual learning environment to whatever task they're being trained to do outside the virtual environment. Um, it is sometimes used for social um, competencies, not just for kind of, I've talked a lot about motor skills, um, uh, the, but um, virtual learning environments do use simulation to try to teach students um, uh, social competencies, um, uh, not just spatial skills, but social skills um, as well, including empathy. Um, Empathy, you will know, has a um, very um, uh, public um, and contentious um, uh, uh, reputation in relation to um, VR. We have many things to say about that. Wouldn't we be delighted to talk about it um, afterwards? Our, the, actually, the most recent piece that Christine and I have, and I have been working on is about um, uh, the role of empathy and, and, and um, how we might think differently about the value of empathy when we're coming from a relational approach. So more on that later if you're, if you're interested. Um, the thing that, um, the thing that, it, that um, for us was the principal challenge in designing our virtual learning environment is that we are trying to use oral history, trying to use this VLE to enhance students' understandings of the lived experience of place in order to address a history of harm um, that is rooted in systemic racial injustice um, and move them towards, as Christina said, um, some capacity for um, enacting right relationships and equality of relationship in their own communities. So, not, so the learning isn't, isn't about reproducing something that happens inside the virtual learning, but there's no direct transfer from, I'll train you to do this inside the VLE, then you'll be able to do this other thing outside the VLE. And also, we can't simulate the thing that we're trying to illustrate because simulation would reproduce the patterns of harm um, that uh, former residents of the home have experienced and, and would run the risk of, of traumatizing students um, in the witnessing of those, um, of those stories. And the former residents were very, very clear about that, that there would be no simulation in this environment. So the question is, if we do not have simulation and our, um, our aim is not present, what are we making? How do we make this thing? Uh, are you switching that slide for me, Christina? Oh, thanks. Um, so um, where that um, led us was to a different way of thinking about what kind of um, engagement we were, um, we were aiming for, for um, participants in our VR experience. Um, we tried to think about privileging witnessing. So in characterizing participants as witnesses to rather than participants in um, the virtual learning environment that they were um, occupying. And that led us to think very differently, for example, about interactivity. So if I'm witnessing something that I may not have the, uh, it may not be appropriate for me to have the expectation that when I, um, when I, uh, when I move, when I act as a participant, the virtual illusion will respond. That may not be um, particularly important. It was important to us to decenter technology and center the first voices whose stories we were witnessing. 
So we needed to think not about the affordances of the technology, how do we fit into what the technology is already understood to be good at, but how do we manipulate those things for a purpose that other people have not necessarily used it for before, and that purpose specifically um, was the relational approach that um, Christina has um, described. Um, that meant that um, we could think differently about what kind of image, what kind of um, virtual illusion we could represent. It need not necessarily be realistic. What you're seeing here on your screen now is as realistic as it gets. This is hyper-realism, um, video shot, documentary style um, of uh, Tony on the left there you see and Jerry and Tracy. Um, on the rock in that sequence that Christina described. This realism, this level of realism is referred only for representations of the former residents themselves embodied um, and um, speaking to one another. Everything else you see in, um, in, the, uh, in the virtual environment we created is impressionistic, combines different technical elements along the lines of what you saw in the, um, in the swamp water story. Um, and that is, um, from our perspective, um, was a way um, to remind um, participants that they were not uh, the, um, participants, but were witnesses to um, what is happening. And then lastly, of course, we are not so interested in what you do inside the virtual learning environment. We're interested in what you do outside the virtual in, in learning environment. So we were trying to avoid creating the sense of a hermetically complete um, perfect world. We wanted a world where you could see gaps and fissures in the representation and that would invite you um, to maintain a kind of perspective as a witness to start asking questions about why things happened and how things had happened. And so that again is another reason for the impressionist um, uh, aesthetic that we, um, that we use. Um, what we ended up with um, was a, um, a, a kind of a different, a, a, a conceptual um, framework um, that could act as design parameters for us moving forward in terms of what we were aiming to um, uh, produce um, in, uh, in participant experience. So rather than presence, um, to try to think about what relation for that presence, which is a forgetting of self and a forgetting of technology, um, to try to think about um, what relational president, presence might mean. And so this is the kind of rubric that we came up to help us understand what the differences um, might be. Um, rather than reconstructing um, events or places, um, we, were, what we were interested in rendering their meaning, not exactly what they were, not trying to represent facts, but, um, uh, but representing experience. Uh, not generating a sense of being somewhere, being, presence is often thought of as being there, so not, not being interested in the, the participants being, but in the participants perspective, giving them a sense of perspective. Not asking participants to identify with the experiences that what they were witnessing, but to understand how those experiences might be different from their own and start to ask questions about difference, communicate across difference, um, which once we can do that, then we can have some sense of relationality. Um, not interact with the environment, not expect that we would have agency inside somebody else's story, um, but to receive the story, to listen, to witness, um, and not to empathize, um, not to expect that we would have that kind of cathartic, satisfying experience of um, feeling with someone, um, but being left with the difficulty of maybe not completely understanding or having to wrestle with the difficulty of the new knowledge that we're gaining about the very um, uh, uh, harmful experiences that former residents had. I thought um, to, to conclude, since we've told you a little bit about our sort of design principles, um, we thought that we'd actually show you a clip of uh, the student feedback about uh, having gone through the VR. Um, and so we were very uh, honored to have the CBC, the National, um, go and actually interview some of the students during the uh, pilot project that happened a little bit over a year ago. So if we have time, um, I believe I need to stop sharing and then I'll need to reshare a different screen. So bear with me so that you can uh, see this. Thank <laughs> you. 
put that on. 15 year old Shakima Johnson says she didn't know anything about the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children until she got a virtual experience, even though it's located across the street from her family's church. I really just thought it was just a home. I was like, they're doing good in the community, but I didn't know that they actually did that much harm to children and didn't deserve it. It's something that went on for decades, uh, for generations. Tony Smith, a fair skinned black child, was one of them. And there was a very traumatic experience that I witnessed of my friend taking a beating that um, ended up causing his death. And the way that the home covered it up, it made me feel that they can do whatever they want to you, that my life is nothing. Smith helped launch a class action lawsuit that resulted in settlements totaling $34 million in 2014. The Premier issued a public apology and launched a restorative inquiry. This pilot project in two high school classrooms is part of that commitment. The inquiry was designed to help people learn and understand the history of the home, its significance for the province, and how we come to understand central issues around uh, systemic racism and the way forward for the province. Oh, it feels like they're in the house. The virtual reality experience allows you to hear from three former residents of the home. They tell stories of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, but also talk about people who try to help them. Ms. Johnson, who was the cook at the home, uh, and she would always sneak him a bread and butter on the, sh on the ledge because she knew he was always hungry. So doing the project made me feel really connected to like my culture. But the two-week curriculum provides time for the students to share their feelings. You can read a book, but you're never actually going to understand it until you really like see it and get to kind of, you're not really ever going to experience the experience is you kind of get to see what their life was like. It's very empowering and it's something that I'll never get tired of. There are plans to implement the program in schools across the province. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Cole Harbor, Nova Scotia. So we'll, we'll conclude and end there, but I would just like to, to quickly have a word of thanks that we have a lot of partners in the project and a lot of members of the team, obviously, who, who are not here right now, uh, particularly Tony, Tracy, and Jerry, who um, have, have allowed us to give these kind of talks and presentations um, with their well wishes. Um, but we have a lot of university partners as well as the inquiry itself, uh, the African Canadian Services Division of the Department of Nova Scotia, as well as other educational partners. So we just wanted to end on a, a word of thanks to all those partners to recognize their contributions. Okay, so. Uh